Hello and welcome to The Mastering Show. My name is Ian Shepherd. I'm a mastering engineer and I run the production advice website aimed at helping you get better results recording, mixing and mastering your music. And my usual co-host, John Tidy, is having a week off this week. Uh, instead, I have Ian Stewart joining me. Um, now, Ian is a mixing and mastering engineer. Um, he's actually someone who took my home mastering masterclass course. Um, and we've been talking online for years before that, I think. How long ago was it you took the course, Ian? Oh, it was at, l I think it's coming up on two years. Wow. I can't really, believe it. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say a year, but I, I, I think it has to be longer ago than that. Yeah, no, I think you're right. It was in the spring. Um, and so a year and a half, something like that. How time flies. Indeed. Um, anyway, so Ian, <laughs> welcome to The Mastering Show. Uh, Ian has come along to help me out with the topic this week because uh, he suggested a blog post for my site, a guest post, which I thought was a great idea. He hasn't written it yet. It's going to come at some point in the future, we hope. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to do a podcast on the same topic. So Ian seemed the natural person to ask along to help me out with it. Because if I'm honest, I start getting slightly tangled up in knots on the topic that he's going to help out with, <laughs> which is mid-side processing. And th so the, the overall topic this week is stereo, stereo image, stereo depth, and stereo processing, what it is, how you can measure it, and how you can influence it in mastering. The other thing I wanted to say about Ian is that I'm just really glad that he took the course because he's still a very active member of the Facebook group people can join in with if they take the course. Um, and it's really helpful for me because I don't always have as much time as I would like to contribute to the discussions there. And Ian is one of, uh, there's, a, there's a few people now who are, who've been members in the course and the kind of people who, when they answer a question, I can pretty much guarantee they're going to give the answer that I would have given if I'd have had the time, um, which <laughs> is a huge benefit to other members of the course, I know, and also helps me out. So thank you for that, Ian. Oh, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, so let's get down to uh, business. I thought we could start off by just talking about what stereo image is. It's, it's a kind of a bit of a rabbit hole that we could spend a lot of time on and since this is going to be focused on mastering so in this case we're going to be talking mainly about stereo because i think that's what the vast majority of people are working with still you know 5.1 obviously it's a really exciting format to work in but uh, it's a pretty specialist uh part of the market still and in its simplest form stereo is just more than one track two tracks so you know you have the flexibility to pan sounds around. So, you know, you can have the simplest form, goes right back to the beginning of panning hard left, hard right, or in the center. Um, and I guess that's the simplest, that's what we get. If you have a, let's say you have um, a synth sound or a DI'd instrument on your mixer and you use the pan control to control where it appears in the stereo spectrum from left to right. That's what I think of as the simplest, most basic form of stereo because basically all you're controlling is the level of the signal. Um, you know, if it's hard left, then it's full level in the left channel and zero level in the right channel. The converse applies and if it's in the center, it's equal level in both channels. Actually, that depends a little bit on the DAW or the mixer that you're using. There's a thing called a pan law that determines how the level changes as you pan it from left to right. But give or take, it's the same level. And to my mind, it's still a mono signal. It's just panned within the stereo image. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, you have a true stereo signal. If you like, something was recorded with at least two mics in a real space. I kind of think of a single channel being panned in stereo as being very flat, very two dimensional. You know, it's basically just a left to right control. Whereas if you have a stereo pair capturing the sound of something, an instrument in a room, it's almost like it's three dimensional. In fact, if we jump straight to one of my favorite ways of recording sound, that's a little bit esoteric, which is binaural uh, stereo recording. That's a technique where you insert the mics into a model of a human head, including the ears. Um, the point being that the sound that reaches the mics, you don't just get the differences in timing that signals have when they hit two mics. You know, if it comes from the left, it hits one mic slightly before the other. The sound also has to bounce around the shape of a human head 
and find its way to the mics through this very specific shape that we have to our ears, which add all kinds of frequency coloration to the sound. And the, the point of this is that you can get an incredible three-dimensional result from it. In fact, I got myself a binaural mic a year or two ago. It was a Christmas present, and I was I, I just I kind of did a test recording with this thing. You actually, the, the microphones are wearable. You tuck them into your ears like a pair of earbuds, so you're using your own head to uh, capture all this extra information about the sound. And... Uh, then I realised I didn't have anything to play this recording back on. So I came through here to, to my little studio, um, you know, pop the headphones on, hit play, and suddenly the stereo came to life. And I was completely, I was like, what, what happened there? I hadn't, that can't be right. I didn't even touch. And then I realised that it wasn't my monitoring system that, that was playing back audio. I was hearing this binaural recording and I was hearing the sound of the TV in the room that I'd just come from playing back. But the, the impression that I had of it being in a real space, kind of just over there somewhere, was so realistic that my brain immediately assumed that it was coming from the speakers in the room rather than from the headphones on my head. So that's kind of, in my mind, the, the kind of the ultimate stereo recording. Have you, have you ever played with binaural, Ian? Yeah. I've I've never made any recordings uh, myself, but I've listened to a bunch, and uh, yeah, as you were saying, it, it it can be almost spooky, especially if you've got a really good pair of headphones. I've played things and and spun around in my chair because I was convinced that there was, you know, a person walking up behind me or or whatever it may be. It's it's kind of amazing. Yeah, exactly. In fact, I I was demonstrating this to my father-in-law. Um, and he had the headphones on. He was kind of listening to the sound of this TV recorded, and I don't think he was really, you know, kind of noticing anything special. And then the recorded sound of one of my sons right next to, I mean, originally it was next to my head, but obviously then suddenly it was next to his head suddenly appeared, and he literally flinched. He kind of lurched to one side and, you know, just looked completely baffled. Yeah. Anyway, so that's my, that's my for me, that's kind of the ultimate stereo sound where you're actually capturing... As, and one interesting thing about I find about it is it works better indoors because it's all about the reflections from the walls and the surfaces around you and stuff. You, you kind of imagine that it would be great for capturing ambiences outdoors, but unless you're in an, I mean, I guess in a in a city street maybe, or if you're, I don't know, uh, up against a cliff next to a waterfall, those kind of situations where there are some reflections, that mm. kind of might work. But often just the kind of the sound of being out and about in the world is actually slightly underwhelming just because you don't have... It's 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 what our brains do with all of that spatial information that's kind of encoded, if you like, in the shape of the room around you that that gives the kind of the really exciting effects for me. I I will say if if uh, any of the listeners have not experienced this, there are now I think a wealth of binaural recordings on YouTube. Um, so if it's not something you've ever checked out, you can go there and and find uh, yeah endless yeah. numbers. And you know the the key thing is to remember is to just to use headphones because that's that's the idea. Yeah, and I think the... I mean, it still works as a stereo sound, yeah. uh, as a stereo signal through speakers, but you just don't get the same kind of uh, three-dimensional eff effect from it right. without the headphones. The, I mean, actually, I think it, it's now becoming a thing. I think uh, it's being kind of rebranded, if you like, 3D sound. Yeah. And I believe there's a standard that's been set up um, that enables it to be used within games and stuff. So I think we can expect lots more binaural audio in future because, of course, more and more people are listening to audio on earbuds and headphones these days. And, uh, I mean, another interesting thing I heard recently was just uh, a recording of a, a BBC The Proms from the Royal Albert Hall. Hmm. And they did some test recordings of those in binaural, which were fascinating because rather than just using a dummy head in the way that I just described, they were actually using whole arrays of microphones, but then applying all kinds of post-processing to them uh, to kind of allow them to integrate those into the overall 3D sound image, if you like. Um, and the, the results in some cases are absolutely stunning. So, yeah, if, if anybody hasn't heard any binaural, I, and, you know, I think anybody listening to this show is probably likely to be just excited by the possibilities of, of recorded sound, it's something that has to be heard, I think. So if that's at one extreme, and then at the other extreme you have kind of a single instrument being panned left to right... In between is this whole spectrum of possibilities. Uh, you know, you could um, you could move from say an electronically generated sound that has no acoustic information in it at all to a close mic'd instrument that has maybe just a little bit of ambience in it to the kind of thing that you hear in the early Beatles recordings, where actually if you 
if you listen to those, especially if you listen on headphones, because back in those days, there were no pan controls on the mixing desk. So you literally only had the option of going left, right, or in the center of the image. If you just listen to one channel of those, quite often you can hear there's a surprising amount of room sound, of studio sound uh, in the signal. And that's part of what gives those recordings their unique flavor. You know, the sound of Abbey Road back then um, recorded with probably the mics much further back than we're used to these days. That's still a mono signal, but it's got some of that reflection information, some of that information about the space. And then as soon as you move to multiple mics um, or multiple channels, then you've got the option of really trying to create a real stereo image. And I've actually come up against this myself just recently because I've, for the first time in ages, I've been doing some, some serious mixing for a friend of mine, Dan Ecclestone, who's got a new album out. And it's he uh, has the, the challenge that he's set himself of. He's using, I think it's Cubasis, the, the piece of software, which only has 16 channels to record on, a bit like the um, Pro Tools Lite version. That, I don't know if it's still available, but it was around for a while. Uh, Pro Tools Free, maybe now they call it. So he, he's got, And he's got real drums on there, so five or six channels are used up on the drums. So he's got a really limited track count to, to fit these arrangements into. So things that I might choose to record in stereo, like uh, accordion, Hammond organ, Fender Rhodes, those kind of instruments he's all of those are in mono which he's done for for practical reasons but gives me a real challenge when i'm mixing to try and add some space to those in an interesting way and i've been experimenting i've, I've recently discovered the the waves real adt plugin which is an emulation of uh is it automatic d double tracking is that what adt yeah, is the, the process automatic that, or automated something like that yeah adt that was invented um I think in two different studios at the same time, but certainly by the engineers at Abbey Road, um, in order to kind of add thickness and body and flanging as well to the sounds that they were using back then, where you would run the sound out to a, a tape machine and combine those sounds. Or in my case, I'm panning one of them hard left and one of them hard, or to different places in the stereo image anyway, to create an impression of stereo image in the sound that was originally mono which is just such good fun. And literally, <laughs> I've, I've overused this plugin so outrageously. Um, but it sounds great. I, I, I love it. It's, um, it's my new favorite thing. And then there's the stuff that everybody, you know, we're probably all familiar with anyway, where you use things like delays, things like chorus, effects like reverb, all of these effectively tricks to try and create some kind of three-dimensional image in the sound. Oh, and by three-dimensional, I think the, the key thing that I'm getting at is front to back. Um, you know, if you have that pan pot with that single mono channel, like I say, you can pan it from left to right, but it's just kind of going in a, a line or maybe a curve between the two speakers. Um, and for me, the really interesting stuff is where you can get stuff to appear to be behind the speakers or maybe further out left than one of the speakers or further out right. Um, you know, binaural can even create the impression that things maybe are uh, up and behind your head or below you sometimes. That's one of my favorite bits of, of recording and mixing is to, to capture that. Um, and the point about this podcast is how can we influence that stuff in mastering? Ian, how about you? Do you ever mess with the stereo image when you're mastering or do you just kind of say, well, this is what it is and I'm going to go with what the client's given me? I kind of try not to um, hmm. it, if I can avoid it. Uh, but I will say the the last single I mastered last week there was stereo information there, but the whole thing just still felt very, very narrow. And by using a, an EQ in, in mid-side mode and just kind of pushing a few different areas in different directions, uh, nothing drastic, you know, a dB here, a dB and a half there, it, it really just it made the whole thing feel a lot bigger and deeper. And um, so, yeah, if needed, I won't not do it. Yeah, I, th I think I'm the same. Um, um, and maybe we can kind of explore that point a little bit more in a minute. I guess one of the first things that people are often asking me is, so we'll talk about how to influence it in a minute. Um, one of the first questions is, how do you, ca can you measure it? You know, we can mm. measure levels using various kinds of meters. We could measure, to some extent, EQ balance using, you know, a, an analyzer. But it is also possible uh, to measure stereo image to some point and uh one way is to use i described it recently as the um a jellyfish monitor 
you know, uh, a kind of a kind of plot that you used to get on an oscilloscope where you have left and right on different axes so that a mono sound appears as a straight line. Right. But a stereo sound appears as a much more complicated shape, kind of sort of swirly, you know, sometimes it could be an ellipse, sometimes it just looks like a complete squiggle, sometimes you get really fascinating um, shapes on it. And in general, the wider the stereo image, the wider the display you get on one of those. Is that, is that a phase scope? What's the technical it's, name for one of those? Yeah, I think go, goniometer, goniometer is something I've seen. Um, You're right. Yeah, yeah. phase scope. Uh, I mean, really, it, that's originally it was an old oscilloscope in XY mode. Uh, yeah. Where, you know, two channel oscilloscope where your left channel's driving one of the oscilloscope channels and your right channel's driving the other. I'm, just, I'm thinking of a video I watched the other day that that had a whole other ra- rabbit hole, but there's music that's made for oscilloscopes that exploits uh, all these kind of stereo tricks and uh, phase scopes. And uh, if anyone's interested, you can look up Jerobeam Fenderson, and th- there's a whole rabbit hole right there. But <laughs> oh, cool! We'll put that link in the show notes uh. on the on the masteringshow.com. Um, you're absolutely right, and I think I'm right in saying that the one of my favorite bands is a band called Orbital. UK mm, kind of yeah. dance electronica band. I'm pretty sure their uh, their kind of logo was I don't know which atom it is, but it's the orbitals of a might be a helium or a hydrogen atom, just kind of simple kind of overlapping ellipses. But I'm pretty sure they have a sound that makes that shape when you display it on a phase scope that they use in some of their music. So yeah, huh. I, yeah. lots of nerdy fun to be yeah, out of that. Absolutely. Um, so that's one way. I don't find a phase scope like that. So, I mean, it's kind of useful because a mono sound will immediately jump out as a straight line, but it's pretty hard to get any, I would say, any really sophisticated information. I mean, I think if it, if the shape of it is kind of an oval that is taller than it is wide, you're probably in reasonable shape in terms of the stereo. If it gets so that the shape of it is wider than it is tall, that's when you're starting to run into some of the problems that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But my favorite way of measuring stereo width really what is which is what we're talking about uh, is something called a correlator which is basically it's just a, a numerical scale it has zero in the center it goes to minus one on the left and plus one on the right and basically um, it's a similar idea to plotting the xy like you say on an oscilloscope except it's just displayed as a 2d scale and if you have a sound that is completely mono meaning the left and right channels are identical then a correlator will read plus one. If you have a sound where the polarity of one channel is inverted, uh, which we sometimes say the phase is flipped, um, so you have the exact opposite on the left channel of what you have on the right channel, uh, then it will read minus one. Um, And that typically is, I would say, a fault, because if you try and mono that signal, the left and the right will cancel out completely. You'll hear no audio. Uh, it's the kind of thing that happens if you have a cable that's wired badly. Um, there, are, I can't think of many situations where you get something that extreme in a real life recording situation. Um, and then in the center, you have zero, which I guess an example of something that would produce a reading of that hovers around zero. I mean, because correlator readings tend to fluctuate a lot. They kind of waver around all over the place. But it's something that typically re- registers zero might be a really wide stereo image of a symphony orchestra where actually, you know, nothing is the same as it is on both channels except for the little bit that's right in the middle of the stereo image. Everything else is spread out. So you don't get uh, any readings that get really close to plus one. Um, You, in the same way, you don't get anything that's the exact opposite. I mean, that's basically a kind of an electronic artifact rather than something you find in the real world. And you have a really even spread of sound so the correlator probably hovers around about zero. And that's, in, in just in totally really simple terms, that's my suggestion for anybody listening to this. Get yourself a correlator. I mean, there's one built into the original TT meter. There's one built into the um, Voxengo span analyzer. You can find correlators usually in metering plugins in a, in a bunch of different utilities and, and plugins out there. And I think your goal should be that the correlation of your audio signal should be between zero and one uh, the vast majority of the time. And depending on how wide a stereo image you have, that might be closer to zero or it might be closer to to one. Um, and pretty much any value in between those is acceptable. 
and even the occasional push into the negatives, especially if there's lots of reverb or lots of chorus in the signal, then you might start to get some negative correlation values. But if it's constantly pushing negative, especially if it gets, I don't know, further than minus a half, if you listen to those sounds and watch the correlator, everything starts to sound kind of odd at that point. <laughs> I mentioned this way back um, in an early episode. I think I'm right in saying that some people have a very extreme reaction. If you have that situation where the, the polarity of one channel is flipped, especially if it's a bass sound, if you have a very low frequency, pure sound, and one channel is flipped, so you get a correlation of minus one, um, some people will actually throw up um, when they when they hear that, if they, especially if you play it to them through headphones. It has a so that's a kind of an extreme reaction. It's quite a, and, and I have a similar thing where if you have lots and lots of negative phase correlation in a signal, it feels odd. It feels inside out. It feels unnatural. Um, and I guess, yeah, slightly sickly. Uh, do you get that? Do you find when you listen to this kind of stuff, that kind of unnatural feeling? So much, so much. I've never, yeah. I've never thrown up, but I, I, yeah. I, I think I've gotten more sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. I never remember it bothering me before, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago. And then I slowly started to notice it. And now it's to the point where, yeah, if there's one little thing in a recording that somehow has ended up completely out of phase, it'll drive me completely crazy. Um, mm. And I'll be turning my head sideways and, and looking around and making odd faces. And yeah. <laughs> not that's, a good that's time interesting. for me <laughs> no, no absolutely and the, and even if you have something where i mean we're about to start talking about processes where you can manipulate this kind of effect if you go too far with a stereo widening process i mean it's it's pretty rare that you can push it so hard that you'll get something that's actually an antiphase you know where the polarity is flipped on one channel yeah. but the more negative i agree you start i start to get uncomfortable in my i kind of sitting here and i you know i start kind of trying to pop one ear you know that thing where yeah. you feel like you're, the plane is flying too high or you you know you feel like you're going slightly deaf somehow even though you can hear everything it's a it's it's an odd um it's obviously a, you know not something that happens much in the the natural world that we've experienced so it feels strange so if i may the only hmm. thing I, I would kind of add to the the discussion of of correlators um i find it to be fairly dependent upon the type of material. So okay. for instance, like this song that I was, that I was mentioned before where I did end up do some lighting on it. Um, you know, by the time I got it to a place where it sounded a way wider than it, than it was when it was delivered to me and B what I thought was, you know, a, a pretty good place overall, the correlator was maybe going down to 0.7. Um, but already it sounded very wide. So there, if I had tried to push it to be close to zero, it would have, you know, kind of fallen apart. Whereas, like you mentioned, uh, orchestral recording, something like that, you know, maybe naturally just has a much lower correlation. Um, so I guess I would just caution people if, you know, don't think, oh, I can push it till it goes to almost zero and uh, ears, that's, ears yeah. be damned. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's that's a really good point. So when I say that you should be aiming for between zero and plus one, I guess what I'm saying is don't worry if your signal naturally starts out with a low correlation necessarily, if it sounds good. It's very difficult to take something that has that starts off with a very high correlation, you know, kind of say up a sort of close to one. You have to do a lot of processing to change that value significantly, and it will probably start to sound bizarre a long time before you get anywhere close to zero because okay well so so let's let's start talking about processing because then we can talk about the effects of what this stuff has on the music so we'll talk about exactly how this works in a little more detail in a minute people always ask me what kind of stereo processing i use and the answer is just like ian i'm very minimalist you know, I try to do as little as possible on this kind of stuff. And when I do do anything, I keep it very, very simple because there are some pretty sophisticated stereo processing plugins out there that do some really odd things. I can pretty much say they're completely inappropriate for mastering uh, in almost every respect. You know, if you're making EDM and you have some wild sound and you want, you know, it to pan rapidly from one speaker to the other or to sound like it's coming from outside the room or any of these kind of things as a as a creative artist that's 
you're you know of course you're free to do that but as a mastering engineer you know i think we need to be looking out for things like that that are maybe not appropriate and trying to correct them but i don't think we should be trying to uh cause effects like that at all so i basically only use two types of stereo processing when i'm mastering one is mid-side processing mseq which we're going to talk about in a minute the simpler one is basically just a simple stereo width control and this is related to mid-side processing but we'll come to that in a minute typically you have a, a dial on it that's set to zero to begin with and you can probably dial it uh, down to minus 100 percent and up to 100 percent, or sometimes it goes between zero and 200 and 100 is in the middle um, that kind of thing and basically if you pull this thing all the way down to its minimum setting uh, the signal collapses into mono so that's basically exactly the same as taking the pan controls of two channels on a, on a mixing desk and panning them in um, so it's one control that controls the pan of both of those and you pull it and it, and it you know then the image gets narrower and narrower and narrower and then collapses into mono the interesting part is when you turn it the other way and you can actually make it seem that those channels are panning out further than they were before you're effectively reducing the level of the the center of the image or that's how it sounds and that's why these processes start to get unnatural quite quickly, because you will start to hear, you know, very often you have various bits of the mix pan centrally, or, you know, often the vocals, bass and drums, for example. Then you might have a few other things panned elsewhere. Uh, uh, but the, one of the big things that you hear spread around the rest of the stereo image is things like chorus and reverb and the, uh, you know, the stereo information that we were talking about, um, the space that things were recorded in. As you start to increase the stereo width, you reduce the emphasis on the, the central information in the image and you hear more of that stuff around the edges. So it often has the effect of appearing to bring up the reverb, which can be quite nice if things sound a little bit dry to begin with, but can start to sound pretty odd pretty quickly. Um, and the same with, you know, effects like chorus and delay uh, and all the rest of it. And if you reduce it down too much, you start to get this kind of weird inside out effect that i was talking about and i think part of the reason that it sounds unnatural to us is like we said because you don't experience that stuff in the real world much and in fact our brains are really good at tuning that stuff out you know the it's quite amazing how we're uh, our brains and our ears are tuned to for example to make speech intelligible so if you uh, try and have a conversation with somebody who's 50 feet away from you in a cathedral uh, you hear not very much of their voice and a huge amount of the echoey spacious sound that kind of drifts in from all around you but our ears are very good at tuning that out to make sure that we can still understand what somebody's saying to us and that's presumably some kind of survival instinct evolutionary thing what's interesting to me is that when you i mean everybody knows this you you hear a, a sound in a room and it sounds great to you you record it and you listen back to the recording and the recording sounds much more roomy, sounds much more ambient suddenly. Um, and there's something that happens when we record. I mean, it's basically because microphones are not ears. Um, when our ears are in a real environment, um, you know, we're doing all kinds of decoding behind the scenes to, to make sense of what we're hearing. And we respond differently to that when it's just kind of played back to us from a speaker after being recorded through a microphone. I think that's because our brains are doing the decoding on the environment around us rather than what's coming out of the speakers, perhaps. Uh, I think that's quite a fascinating topic to be explored there somewhere. But anyway, so when you start to uh, reduce the correlation of the signal down so it's significantly lower than it was when it started out, all of this confusing stuff, the echoes off walls, the, you know, the sound of reverbs, the um, chorusy effect, the delay effects that we have in the mix, come to the fore and if you go too far it just sounds bizarre so i think uh, at this point we could start talking about more about how this stuff works in terms of what we're actually doing to the to the signal so now i always talk about this in quite a simple way and the whole point of ian's blog post that he's going to write is to point out some of the, the subtleties that are involved so i'm going to do my simple explanation and then let him talk for a bit about how that can be misleading um <laughs> the i mean we talked about this the stereo width control and basically when you pull that down to a minimum the the channels get panned in and it, the signal collapses down to mono the opposite extreme where you polarity invert one channel 
and mix them together to mono, at which point, rather than getting everything that was in the middle, everything in the middle cancels out, because originally you had the same thing on the left and the right channel, suddenly you, one of those is the exact opposite, so when you put those together they cancel out, and you're left with everything that was at the edges of the signal, which is often referred to as the side signal. So the mono signal, left plus right, is called the mid channel, if you like, and the polarity inverted monode version is called the side signal. And, and that's actually a completely equivalent representation of the stereo image. You can take something that was recorded in left and right, convert it to M and S, mid and side, as it's called, and then convert it back again. And you can process those separately, just like you can process the left and the right separately, and it'll have slightly unpredictable results, but you can then recombine it and get a stereo image back out from the signal. So effectively what you're doing when you manipulate the stereo width is you're affecting the amount of mid or side signal. As you reduce the stereo width, you're decreasing the amount of side signal that's in the, the mix, so you hear more mono signal, so, and eventually it collapses down to mono. When you increase the stereo width, you're hearing more of the side signal, you're reducing the mono level of the signal, and eventually you end up with none of that uh, mono information at all. That's my simple uh, description of it, and of course it's useful in mastering because it gives us extra power. For me, one of the fascinating things about mastering is using quite simple tools like EQ and compression on a stereo signal and I'm managing to achieve quite sometimes amazing results with it. Same thing applies to stereo processing. Even though I'm a real minimalist and even though I'm really saying don't do anything except mess with the stereo width and maybe a little bit of mid-side processing that we're going to talk about, you can still achieve some amazing things. So just to give you an example, um, if you have... Uh, let's say there's a boomy resonance in the bass guitar, which is panned centrally in the mix, and you go in and try an EQ to reduce that. The EQ works, but of course your EQ applies equally to the left and the right channels, so it also takes out that same frequency in this nice big synth sound that you've got in the background, or maybe you've got guitars panned uh, out to the edges of the signal, and they start to sound a bit thin and cold when you apply this EQ. Well, there are two ways of doing it. You can either split the signal or convert the signal from left and right into mid and side and just process the mid channel. Or you can use a plugin that does that for you automatically and choose to only process the mid signal. If you just process the mid, you can reduce that EQ on the bass guitar, remove the boom without having the same kind of effect on the guitars or the keyboards or whatever it is that's around near the edges of the signal. And so you get a better result overall, if you're careful and you don't take it too far, which perhaps is something we'll come back to in a minute. So that's my sort of nice, simple description of how this works. Um, but now I'm going to ask Ian to talk in a little bit more detail about how we need to be careful with that. That's an oversimplified view of the situation, and uh, you can run uh, afoul of it, right? It is. I guess I would start by saying that that's the simplification that I hear from pretty much everyone, including people that probably either do know better or should know better. Um, so that's a that's a a very common way to por portray mid and side is that the mid is the stuff that's right down the middle and the side is the stuff out at the edges. You kind of got at the meat of it, which is that mid is left plus right, and side is a phase inverted version of one channel sum back down so you express that as left minus right right let's just take a second for anybody listening that that's new to basically you know if you th just imagine a sine wave when you polarity invert a sine wave you flip it upside down so at the points where the wave was at plus one it becomes minus one and vice versa so mathematically that's just like multiplying the signal by minus one so Instead of left plus right, you have left minus, minus right. Exactly. So you can you could call it mid and side. Another way you may see it expressed is sum and difference, um, which to me is actually a little bit a little bit more accurately conveys what's going on. As you've, you're taking left and right, and then you end up with the sum of those two channels and then the difference between them. Um, but let's just I'm going to try and and talk through an example which which I think illustrates kind of the fundamental pitfall. 
say you've got a, a guitar in your left channel and it's it's just it's panned hard left um so if you were and that that's that's all you've got in your stereo signal you've just got this recording of a hard left pan guitar which i don't know why we have that but we do um so you want to convert that to mid side again don't know why but for this example that's what we want to do you actually end up with that guitar in both the mid and side signals and there's no reverb there's nothing else it's just this hard left uh guitar so if you think about it you take left plus right that's your mid so you get the guitar and then you get left minus right and that's the guitar the the signals are because, identical because there's nothing on the right to cancel out with it right exactly so you've got mid side now you've got two identical signals so you could eq the mid and when you recombine it back with the side, mm, strange things could actually happen to this guitar. Now, usually when you're doing something like mid-side EQ, the kind of overall change in balance between the center image and the edges is, is more noticeable than what might be happening to these hard left and right panned elements. If I were to sum it all up, I would say that don't think just because you're EQing the mid-channel that you're not going to have an effect on elements that are hard panned. That's the, the simple statement. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, that's absolutely right. And, and so just to, to explore that example of yours a little bit more, um, if, we, if we imagine that the, with the, the guitar panned hard left, so it's it's there on the mid and the side channel if we only eq the mid channel we're going to end up with so let's imagine we're notching out 100 hertz in the mid channel because that's where we're uh hearing the boomy bass right that's going to have the effect that we want on the bass guitar but it's also going to apply that eq change that cut at 100 hertz only to whatever part of the guitar came out on the mid channel so when you decode that back into stereo, the way that I like to think of it is you're, you're effectively kind of smearing the stereo image, right? Yeah. With the guitar, because part of it, you know, the bit of it that's out on the left-hand channel, if you like, is not getting the EQ, and the bit of it that's on the mid-channel is getting the EQ. So it's almost like it gets stretched somehow. I think two kind of distinct things can happen. I mean... Uh let's just to exaggerate let's let's imagine you're doing a 6 dB cut right when you recombine them if phase weren't an issue and we'll get back to that i you know i think effectively you end up with a 3 dB cut which is okay not the end of the world but phase may be an issue uh which is where some of this weird smearing kind of stuff can come into play so it's there's there's a lot of extra stuff that can be happening that you're, you know, you think, oh, I'm just affecting the mid and the side, but, you know, there may be a lot more that's happening that if you're not listening for, you don't immediately notice. Right. And I think we can, we can still explore that even further. I mean, you said it's just a 3 dB cut, which is absolutely right, because you, you know, you're taking 6 dB off altogether, but it's spread between those two channels, so it comes out as minus 3 dB overall that's still going to achieve the kind of result that you wanted. You know, I mean, it's not because we're not saying this effect, this technique doesn't work. Right. When I EQ the mid channel, I do get the result I want, which is in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I can EQ the mid bit, the bass guitar and not affect what's at the edges. Actually, I am affecting what's at the edges, just not as much as the mid signal, right? right. Because my 6 dB cut on the mid channel on something that's only in the middle of the image is going to achieve a 6 dB cut exactly as I want it to. But if there's something panned hard left or hard right, it's going to have a, a smaller effect on those. And if there's something that's kind of somewhere in between, then it'll have yet another effect. Right. There'll be kind of a, on those. a gradient. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So then you end up adding a kind of general EQ overall to kind of balance these two. And they're kind of fighting against each other. At the end of the day, you can get some really effective results with it. But you also need to be careful because, I mean, you mentioned phase. Thinking back to the EQ episode way back when we first started this podcast, I talked about the difference between minimum phase EQs and phase linear EQs. If you're using a phase linear EQ that doesn't change the phase relationships of the signal when you apply the EQ, I think the mid-side processing should be much more predictable yes. in that sense, um, where 
you know, uh, it will have some, it'll have different effects on the EQ depending where in the image things are panned, but that's basically all that will happen. But if you introduce into that as well the fact that something different could happen to the phase of the signal at different frequencies, which is the case with all analog processing, then when you recombine those uh, channels, the, the M and the S signal back into a stereo image, that's when, uh, you know, if the phase has shifted differently at one frequency, then those frequencies will cancel out in some ways and other frequencies won't cancel out and things get a lot, yeah, exactly. You get the, the, the smearing effect and things start getting really quite odd. So, yeah. Yeah. I guess to me is, you know, you're saying, you know, we're not saying don't use this technique. It's a, it's a valuable technique, obviously. Um, to me, it kind of, it, it almost comes down to like confirmation bias, right? Which I think you've talked about before. So if you're expecting to only hear a cut in something in the middle, maybe that's all you're going to notice. Um, and then you send it off to your client who doesn't know what you've done. So they're just listening to it with open ears and, and they notice, hey, well, the guitar has kind of lost some of their meat. So I think to me, that's the important element is just understanding uh, what this kind of process is doing so you can know what to listen for and listen, you know, okay, if I'm making a cut to the mid, what is it doing to the hard pan elements? You know, uh, maybe you temper how much of an adjustment you make based on that. That to me is kind of the, I guess, the fundamental bit of it. Right. It's because it's exactly like left and right. Yeah. It's not like EQing the left channel will only affect something that's on the left because the left channel includes everything that's panned hard left and then a whole range of stuff that's panned more towards the center. Yeah. You've got the left and the right channel and it includes information about the center. With M and S, you've got the mid information, but it also contains information about everything that's in between the, the mid and the side channel. So that the misnomer uh, is misleading because it's tempting to think that the mid channel only has the mids and the side channel only has the sides. Yeah. Just like it's tempting to think that the left channel only has the lefts and the right channel only has the rights. Neither of those is true. They do hold the extreme left and right and mid and side informations, but they also influence everything that's in between. Yes. So as soon as you start to influence something that's on the left-hand side of the signal you're going to have an effect on things that are in the middle of the signal in terms of their EQ balance. And the same is true for the mid and side or the sum and difference channels. The stuff that's in between those extreme positions will also get influenced. So if you had a left, centre, right mix where things are only panned centrally or hard left or hard right, you probably can use these techniques uh, and not have any adverse effects. But pure LCR mixes are still pretty rare. Um, even if you use that as a, as a strategy when you're mixing, most people pan, I certainly pan stuff in between um, all the time. And that's where things get messy. Yeah. This is exactly the reason I asked you to be uh, a guest on the, this episode is to help because this stuff makes my brain hurt. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just trying to think about the, the, the converse must also apply, right? If we apply an EQ to the side channel, there are going to be circumstances where that also affects the mid channel. Is that true, or does it always is the side processing it, always only affect the sides? The converse can certainly be true. I I think in terms of of uh, what people are likely to try and achieve, like a um, use case scenario, right? It's it's less likely that that's going to happen. I think more often people are trying to adjust some, you know, they're trying to boost the vocal a little bit or cut a little boomy, you know, something in the middle. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, you think about what the side channel is, it's left minus right. So if what you're working on is something that's completely an antiphase, then no, it wouldn't affect the mid channel. But if it's something that's, you know, a panned element that you're, that's what you're trying to have an effect on, then yeah, potentially. Yeah. I actually do that sometimes. So I need to I mean, at the end of the day, this is one of those, if it sounds good, it is good situations, but it's also one of those with great power comes great responsibility yeah. uh, situations. So I use stereo width manipulation, just a simple kind of dialing in more or less of the side channel effectively to either widen or narrow the stereo image. Maybe one in 10, you know, maybe on one track of a 10 track album or maybe on one album out of 10, uh, that kind of thing. I use... 
mid-side EQ five or ten times less often than that. It really is, uh, you know, you, you bring it in to, to solve a specific problem. Um, it's not an everyday process is what I'm saying. It's something that you need to do with real care, and sometimes it doesn't work. And at that point, you just have to kind of, you know, accept that, okay, you're not going to be able to achieve the result you were looking for and, and move on. One step beyond mid-side EQ is you'll sometimes hear people talking about mid-side compression, where they might compress the mono signal, but not the side signal, or they might compress the, the, the different signal, the side signal, for example, in different ways. I have done that once <laughs> ever in my career. It wasn't hugely successful, I have to say. I mean, it kind of got the result that I was looking for. Um, but I think the, the, the chances of that achieving what you hope that it's going to achieve are next to zero. Um, and I think if you feel that the mix needs that, that's for me, that's a kind of a red flag. That's a call the client and say, can we get a remix? Can we fix this problem in some other kind of way? Because it's kind of doing all those kind of things that we were just talking about. But, you know, I mean, if you think about it, it it's so basically compression is altering the, the balance between loud and soft. Let's say you're just you just have it set up to, to hold back the louder moments. If you only do that to either the center or the edges of the signal, even in the simplistic version of this explanation you're basically turning the level of the signal up and down in certain parts of the image and not others which is going to start making things move around in the stereo image depending on what the signal is doing um, and then if you start thinking about the kind of the interim where things are not hard panned and the two are interacting with each other and then you start thinking about the phase implications of that <laughs> because you know it's like can worms everywhere um run away I won't say I've never used it, but it's um, it's been very specific instances once or twice. Did it work? I think there's there's one time that, yeah, I listened to the before and after, and the after was marginally, uh, a marginal enough improvement that I said, okay, I'm going to leave this in. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely, it uh, it can start. I mean, you know, you'll hear people talk about, oh, you know, be careful if you're using an unlinked stereo compressor because it'll start shifting the, the stereo image. I mean, this kind of has the same effect. It'll start moving things left and right and make them wider and narrower. And That's a good point. Uh, that's something I haven't mentioned so far in, on, in, in the show, which, and since we're on an episode that's kind of about stereo processing, it's probably worth saying briefly, you know, what Ian was talking about there was most mastering compression and limiting, at least, is, is what you call linked, where if there is gain reduction triggered in the left channel, you'll get the same gain reduction happening in the right channel as well. Um, the advantage of that is it doesn't have any effect on the stereo image uh, because you keep the relationship in terms of levels between the left and the right consistent. The disadvantage is that you can cause pumping in something on the right channel that's more obvious than it would be in the left channel because the thing that's causing it is panned somewhere else in the stereo image. So I have heard people advocate unlinking compression and especially limiting in order to be able to achieve even higher levels without artifacts, uh, meaning pumping that's more noticeable. Personally, I don't do that. Um, you know, I would prefer to keep the stereo image pristine um, and just you know either dial it back so that there aren't any artifacts or find some you know tweak the parameters so that they're less noticeable whatever it is make it work with that link in place um rather than and, and yeah like you say mid-side compression is that times a million right or something. yeah there are times again I, I have used unlinked compression the you know the api 2500 actually has a variable link which is kind of interesting uh, I know, I think you've experimented with Pro-L, right? Which has, that's a, a mm -hmm. limiter, which you can change the link balance between the attack and release phases. So there are there are some neat kind of tricks where, you know, I think the idea with that on, on Pro-L is that um, you can unlink the attack a little bit more. And, and because there are these quick transient events, your ears are less likely to notice kind of changes in level between left and right. But if the release stage kind of happens smoothly together, then it, the stereo image kind of stays more coherent. Um, so there are kind of some neat tricks you, you can do in that domain. But yeah, when it gets to MS, worms. 
<laughs> it's worm. Yeah, it's worms, worms all the way down. <laughs> 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 I agree. And, and I'm kind of skeptical. I mean, I th think ideas like that in the Pro L are interesting, but I'm a little bit skeptical. I start to feel like if you're pushing whatever process it is so hard that you need that kind of degree of tweakability, maybe you're pushing it too hard. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's just me being overly conservative or just I'm, I'm not a huge tweak head in that sense. I kind of like things that work. You know, as always, everybody's free to experiment. I thought of one thing that I didn't mention about just simple uh, stereo width processing um, that I think is quite an interesting point to make. Uh, the nice thing about simple stereo width processing like this is it's completely mono compatible. If you increase the stereo width, you're basically lifting the difference signal, the S signal. Um, when you mono it, that cancels out just as it always did, even though there's more of it. So you won't make a stereo source less mono compatible by tweaking this stuff. Although if you change it too much, you will make the mono and stereo versions sound more different. Every mono signal sounds different than the stereo version because whenever you take something that has uh, different pan levels and different phase relationships and different amounts of reverb and all the rest of it within the mix, as soon as you do a, an L plus R mono of those signals, a certain degree of it is going to cancel out. So, um, you know, every time you mono a signal, the, the mix changes slightly. But obviously, if you boost the stereo mix so there's much more of that difference signal in there, so you hear much more of what's happening around the edges and you maybe hear more reverb and all the rest of it, when that gets monoed, that effect will disappear. So you're effectively making the difference between the mono and stereo versions more noticeable. I, I personally, I don't worry about it too much. Um, you know, I tend to think that anybody who's listening in mono deserves whatever they get because um, <laughs> it's probably a phone or, you know, um, but I mean, John mentioned in the last episode that he likes to listen to stuff on a Bluetooth speaker that he thinks is mono. So I'm probably being unfair there. Um, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, I don't see why people who listen in stereo should suffer in the sense of their sound be less satisfying just because if it gets listened to in mono, you won't get the benefits of those changes. Um, you know, it's just a shame. And it's it's another thing to be aware of when you're doing this kind of processing. And it's, um, well, it leads nicely into the Mastering Maxim for this week, which I will reveal in just a moment. But before I do, Ian, do you think there's anything else we need to cover? Any other points we need to bring out of this little discussion before we get to the Maxim? One plugin I did think of actually when we were talking about metering that I meant to mention. Um, Flux has a, I think it's called Stereo Tool, and it's free, and it has a phase scope and a correlation meter and a bunch of other little knobs you can twist and do nifty things with. Excellent. That's that's a good tip. In fact, I was going to ask you if you had any favorite plugins for either manipulating the stereo image. Well, in fact, let me ask you that. Do you, if, if you, Let's say you just want to increase the stereo width. What's the plugin that you reach for? Vox and Go MSCD. Also free. Excellent. Yep. We'll put the links to all these things. And any other little uh, tools? One that springs to my mind is the latest update to maybe my favorite plugin ever, I would say, which is the, the Klanghelm Vumpt, Vumpt. V-U-M-T. Yes. The, uh, the VU meter emulation I talked about in the loudness episode and, and various other times on the show. It's still incredibly cheap. Um, and you can now get a, a deluxe version of it for something like eight pounds more than the normal version, uh, which has some extra bits and bobs. Actually, it has some things that I don't think belong in a meter, and I'm going to be hiding them and never looking at them, but um, like dynamic EQ and a, a few other bits and bobs. But yeah. the bits that I really do like, you have the ability to choose whether you're monitoring uh, in stereo. Yes. You can mono the signal, which is great. You can also monitor the side signal only, so you can hear how your signal sounds if you cancel out all that center information and just hear what's at quotes, the edges, the different signal. And you can listen to the left and right signals independently. There's a whole load of different things there that you can tweak, um, which is just really nice to have in one place, in the same place as your meters, I think. I was disproportionately uh, giddy about that. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only a mastering engineer, right? But yeah, um, the the whole the whole monitoring section for me, I've I've set up a, couple different plugins and key commands and basically a way to quickly do that and i was like oh now i just have that in one plugin it didn't quite map out the way i was hoping but still it's uh yeah i love that yeah exactly uh, so yeah any other plugins before we 
the fab filter pro q is kind of my one of my go-to eqs just because you can so easily switch between uh minimum phase linear phase uh left right mid side um exactly yeah i think more often than not if i'm doing any sort of width adjustment i actually will do it with an eq but i'm doing extremely broad adjustments so like you know maybe i don't want to increase the width of everything below 100 hertz so i'll just kind of do a a gentle shelf down that low but push everything else up so it's it's kind of like using just a simple width control except you get a little bit of frequency selectiveness i think i'm the same and i guess i would mention there's a couple of multi-band stereo width processors out there that will enable you to do the kind of manipulation we're talking about but only it's effectively the same thing but you can just choose which band you're going to effect when you do this kind of processing um and you've reminded me of another metering uh option to mention which i don't think i really we i can do it justice by talking about it i actually did a whole video on it which is on my website and we'll put the link to that in the show notes again on the mastering show.com it's called visualizer it's made by new gen audio um and at my request they added a frequency dependent correlator Ooh. So I thought you would know about this, Ian. It's, I mean, it's, it's fabulous because it gives you exactly that plus or minus one readout that we're talking about, but you can see it by frequency. So rather than an overall thing that tells you how wide or how narrow your image is, you can see which frequency ranges are pushing into the negative phase, if any of them are, or which areas are completely mono, if any of them are. Um, and so, yeah, on those kind of instances where you hear something, you think, well, it's kind of sounds as though something's been polarity inverted, but... Uh, it obviously hasn't, but something's weird here. It can be a great tool for just diagnosing, you know, exactly where you might want to put the that mid or side EQ to, to tighten things up, as you were just describing, or where you might want to set the bands of a multiband uh, width control in order to uh, get things under control. So, I mean, just to give a practical example of where that might be useful, you mentioned at one point how... Uh, the mid and side signal is sometimes called vertical and lateral, mm-hmm. um, but which relates back to vinyl cutting. That's because when in, in a vinyl groove, I think I'm right in saying that the mid signal, the M signal, is cut vertically into the vinyl, and the side signal is cut left and right, uh, or is, is the, the lateral, the, yeah, the, the side-to-side movement of the needle. So vinyl is actually natively... MS, an MS format, which is awesome. <laughs> which is awesome and has <laughs> lots of useful things. Just like like FM radio is the same. FM radio is also MS, and that means that when you mono an FM radio signal, not only do you get an, a, a mono signal, but because the uh, hiss and noise that comes in in the edges often of the uh, stereo image is encoded as the side signal, and that cancels out when you mono it you actually get better signal to noise ratio. So the amount of noise in the signal goes down by monitoring an FM radio signal. Anyway, because of that, that that's, that's why if you have too much out of phase bass content going down to a vinyl cut, it can actually in extreme cases cause the needle to jump out of the groove because the side to side motion of the needle gets so violent that it can't track properly anymore. And that's why often vinyl cutting engineers use an elliptical EQ, which is an EQ that just basically monos the low frequency content of the signal and and then smoothly transitions out of that as, as the high frequency. So it's effectively a multiband stereo width control where it's just reducing the width of the bass so that you don't get too much of that lateral movement with those bass frequencies that can cause problems for playability um, and in particular for loudness or and it relates to how many grooves you can pack into the and therefore the running time of the the side as well and at this point my knowledge about vinyl cutting starts to (laughs) run out so i should probably stop and get another guest who knows much more about it than i do anyway okay i think that's that's plenty for now we can always come back with some extra points oh no you've thought i I did think of the thing that i was going to say before just the idea of converting between mid and side or some indifference yeah you're gonna have to say more how do you mean So, uh, I mean, as pertains to uh, monoing the low end, for example, the typical way to do that is to just roll off the side information of the low frequencies, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if, for whatever reason, 
uh, you've got something where that side information, you know, you're, you're, you, you get a recording and the bass is just completely an antiphase. When you try and mono it and the bass just goes away. Um, so there are some interesting techniques to actually convert stuff that's on the side to being in the mid and re-injecting that into the signal. Right. So and that's something I'm aware of and I haven't played with. I think I'm lucky in the sense that I'm not doing any vinyl cutting. It used to be the case that you, that, that uh, you would kind of say that any kind of out of phase content or or would, in the bass would be a fault. Right. You know, it's this kind of situation where people would look at you and go, "Why? Why would you do that? Right. <laughs> you know, we, we we can't cut it to vinyl. It's, it's are you mad? But and now we have EDM and dubstep um, and the Wub bass, which you know to some degree is is kind of built on that effect. This kind of pulsing in phase, out of phase, wildly panning thing. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and of course, if that's what the artist wants musically, then that's what they should get. And there's no reason not to put that on a CD unless it makes people throw up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and even then, I guess some people would say that's still not a reason not to put it on the CD. But um, so because I've never done any vinyl cutting, I've not had to do that, so I haven't experimented. I mean, have you played with those things? Have you had any I, success with them? I have. I've had, I actually, uh, I'm one of the few mastering guys that uses Ableton. Um, uh, mm -hmm. But Ableton has some features, actually. It's got this effect rack where you can basically build all these parallel chains and map controls. It's really neat. So I've built stuff, you know, basically kind of made my own plugin that does that kind of stuff that can f selectively... Uh, change you know whether uh, a frequency area is on the side or in the mid and there have been a few times that either you get something that i mean there's one time i got something that was completely mono and i kind of reached out to the the mixer and said hey mm, is this did you mean for this to be in mono and he went mono I went okay you know if you get something that's completely in mono there's no side information to boost so you've kind of got to fake it. Um, and that was, that was one way that I, I did that and actually got a kind of fairly natural sounding uh, stereo image. And there have been times where I've had something where the bass was so much in the sides that to just high pass it, um, really you lost too much bass information. So I would kind of do that trick of high passing it and then taking the out of phase a low pass version of the out of phase and turning that back into mid and injecting it back in and being able to get a more coherent uh base w while maintaining the the overall level so. yeah absolutely and i think there are some plugins that do that kind of stuff yep. in one pass for you i think new gen actually might make something that does that as I, well I think, um i think new gen does there's one um i think i want to say DRMS, I think it's Matthew Lane DRMS, kind of mm -hmm. does a similar thing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, these are like, you know, I'm I'm thinking of two instances in all the songs I've mastered. So it's not common, right. but it is, you know, it's, you know, if you're talking about... It's good about, to know the options are there. Yeah, mid-side um, stuff, it's kind of interesting, geeky, fun little tricks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it brings me back nicely now to the Maxim, which... Actually, I mean, I think we're on show 25. I should probably have said this a long time ago because I'm going to use it in the context of stereo processing, but actually it applies to everything we do in mastering. Uh, it's very simple and it is do no harm. Yes. The whole thing about mastering, at the very least, it should sound as good as it did when it arrived with you. That kind of maybe sounds silly, but actually, you know, nowadays with file copying we we take it for granted that a copy of something is going to be exactly the same as it was before but back when i started mastering even if you were just copying a digital tape to another digital tape there were a ton of things that could go wrong in that process and that would degrade the sound sometimes audibly sometimes not um so you know it was a real thing then and it's a real thing now and i think with stereo processing uh it becomes even more important you know because EQ is a linear process. You can undo EQ changes pretty effectively. Dynamics processing is not linear, but if you don't go too far, you're probably going to be okay. With stereo processing, you know, things can go badly wrong very quickly and you can get yourself into a huge mess. Uh, a right pickle, as I might say <laughs> if I was being 
a caricature of myself. Um, <laughs> the, I, th- I think just because you can do something, just because you can do something, it doesn't mean you should. Um, and that really applies to stereo processing. You know, just because we can EQ the sides or we can compress the sides or all the rest of it, you need to really have your ears about you, especially as you were saying, because of the confirmation bias effect, you know, you hear this problem with the bass and you think, oh, I can fix that by just EQing the mid channel. You need always to keep your ears open for what else is happening and what other effects uh, that's causing and whether, you know, you may have addressed that, that one detail that you wanted to fix, but you could have messed up a whole load of other things in the bigger picture. So you have to really keep your wits about you um, with this topic. And, um, I'm imagining anybody who's got to this stage of the podcast is probably thinking, I'm never going to touch any of this stuff again. So <laughs> in, in that case, our mission is accomplished. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I guess I would almost even say that in a way that is the mastering maxim, right? I, yeah, ex- exactly. Um, that's why I said it should, you know, it, it should have been right back at the beginning. I can't remember what my first mastering maxim was, but, um, you know, if we can, um, get a time machine and, and go back and <laughs> insert this into that first ever episode. It's, you know, uh, whatever you do, the goal is to make it sound better or at very least no worse. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not brain surgery, but, um, you know, and that's the, you know, brief tangent. That's why I get so upset about the loudness wars about mastering engineers kind of going, well, the client is always right. And I'm like, yeah, except when they tell you to do something that actually is just basically damage. Yeah. You know, if the client is telling you to just clip the signal or whatever, you know, that's the point where you say, no, listen, it's, I have to, it's my responsibility to say to you that this thing is bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, before we get too hopelessly worthy, I think it's time to wrap this up. Ian, thank you so much for coming on and helping me unpick some of these threads, help me, uh, my poor brain decode some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, my pleasure. Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a joke about MS encoding Decode. decoding in there, but it's <laughs> yeah, it's it's much too late for that. Um, <laughs> anybody who wants to find out more about what Ian does, what's the URL of your blog? IanStewartMusic.us. Uh, there's a a plain old link to the blog and all the other section of the website. Excellent. And Ian has um, a ton of interesting stuff on there. Um, there's a post on dynamics and crest factor specifically how they relate to edm which i think listeners to this podcast would find fascinating stuff on different types of metering r128 dyro metering vu metering the kind of things that i talk about there's one about a comparison between hardware and software versions of the shadow hills uh, mastering compressors which uh, i haven't actually checked out for myself i need to go and look at that with audio um, examples with audio yeah. examples this is what we like <laughs> um so yeah, fantastic. Um, do head over to Insight. We'll put links to this in the show notes as well. Head over there to themasteringshow.com to get all the other episodes, to sign up for the hot list so you're notified as soon as new shows come out and uh, for any other juicy little bits we can think to put there. The show this week is mixed and edited, as always, by John Tidy from reaperblog.net and the music is by Kaylee Law. Ian, thanks very much. Thank you. And everybody else, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.